Hello, and welcome to the podcast where our goal is to remind you that amidst the chaos and craziness of the world, there is still plenty of good that's worth shouting about. In each episode, we're going to be joined by nonprofit professionals, leaders, experts, and advocates to hear their stories, facilitate connection within the nonprofit sector, and hopefully put a smile on your face, because that's always nice. This is Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes. Let's share some good. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Connect. Hello. I'm Matt Barnes. Oh, my God. I said it first. Way to cut me off. I was just about to introduce myself. I know. I said it first. I'm Tiffany, your favorite guest. Well, I guess your host. Co-host. Let's just tell you. Wait, what am I? (laughs) What's my title? Guest host. Guest host. Other person on the podcast sometimes. (laughs) Whatever. Welcome to the podcast. Man, we haven't done some intros in a while. Yeah, I know. It's been a while. It has been a while. About to say a long time, but a while, a long time. Same thing. Tiff has been MIA. Because of injuries and school, but she's yeah. back now. Back and better. Well, back. <laughs> <laughs> Tiff, summer, what do you got going on? You're going on summer. a big trip. You're yes. about to go on a big trip. I am. I'm going to Northern Ireland. So excited for two weeks. It's a school thing, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my school. Very cool. And the weather is going to be cold. And rainy. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh. I'm getting away from the summer heat, which hasn't even hit yet because it's been so gloomy. It has. So June, June gloom, gloom hit hard this yeah. year. Yeah. It is not letting up here in California. I no. know you. I know our non-California listeners feel so bad for us right now. Like, <laughs> oh, you good poor guys out there with some glo- with some overcast weather. I know. Oh, it's so hard. And I know. Yeah, we're complaining so much. I know. I know. Anyway, well, cool. I'm glad that we're recording again. Man, we've had so much going on with Nonprofit Connect, and we're going to have some fun changes coming up to the podcast. I'm just teasing now. And I think think we're going to be doing a bonus episode to kind of cast some vision for the future that we're really excited about. So that's just coming soon. Coming and I'm soon. not saying anything more about it now. 2024. But what I will say is today's <laughs> guest is... He's awesome. I love this guy. He was so great. His name's Hardy Smith, and he is a nonprofit consultant extraordinaire. Wow. I don't know. That sounds... His name is pretty cool. Hardy Hardy Smith, Smith. right? That's a cool name, right? Sounds like a rock and roll name. Yeah. For over 30 years, he has been working with organizations to help them shift their board commitment and drive leadership performance and team and volunteer engagement and all that kind of stuff. He wrote a book called Stop the Nonprofit Board Blame Game. Wow, that's a tongue twister. It is a little bit of a tongue twister, yeah. isn't it? You know, it sticks with you, though. You're like, yeah, ah. but he's basically about like, I think one of the things that I've found working with so many nonprofits is a lot of times they don't use their boards effectively mm. or they're blaming their board for the lack of support and that type of thing, which sometimes is definitely warranted. But sometimes they're they're not being used properly or being set up for success. And when the board is set up for success, then you are set up for more success. And another interesting thing I think we touched on was a lot of people think, oh, this is how you use a board of directors for a nonprofit. And that's the way it's done. But when I'm talking to different people, it varies a lot. Mm. There's not one way to set up your board. So anyway, he's got some great tips and talks about his book. And I'm really excited for everybody to hear the chat we had a little while back now. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. I'm excited. All right. So (laughs) here, after this brief message, will be Mr. Hardy Smith. (laughs) See ya. We are brought to you by Rogue Creatives. I started Rogue Creatives in 2016 because I saw so many people doing amazing things, like life-changing work. And either they're spending all their time trying to figure out how to connect with people and get their story out there instead of doing what they love, what they got into it to do, and what they were good at. Or they ignored all that and they just did what they loved, but not enough people knew about them. Or nobody knew about them. Even worse. My background is in education and organizational leadership. When I was doing my master's in education, I learned that the best way to educate someone to connect their heads and their hearts is through story. In my organizational leadership program, I learned how to help an organization define its character, its voice, its values, its personality. So I took the best of those and I combined them to create the strategic storytelling framework that we use at Rogue Creatives to define an organization's character so that we could tell their story while freeing the organization up to do what they do best. 
We've helped dozens of nonprofits define their personalities and increase their reach as they bring new donors and volunteers into their stories. And as you well know, more donors means more money, means more people getting the help that they need. And that means the world's becoming a better place because of the character in your story. So get started today by visiting roguecreatives.com slash NPC. That's NPC for Nonprofit Connect. And schedule a free brand consultation and take our free online brand character quiz. That's roguecreatives.com slash NPC to begin defining your brand character today. There's no commitment or risk for you at all. And come on, don't you want to meet us? We're super fun, I promise. Rogue Creatives. Seriously, creative storytelling. Okay, enough from me. Back to me. And our guest. All right. Well, Hardy Smith, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here today. Hey, man, it's great. I've been looking forward to this. Congratulations to you and your creative initiative and to launch the Nonprofit Connect podcast. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking over your resume and history, and you got a lot of experience. Before we jump into that, we always open with three random questions. So I've got a list of like, I think we're up to 80 or 90 random questions now. And then we have a randomizer that chooses three. You ready? Far away. All right, here we go. You can insert yourself into any film ever made. Which film would it be? Dumb and Dumber. (laughs) That's got to be my all-time favorite. (laughs) You know, the line when he's there with the good-looking babe and, okay, what are our chances of ever getting together? <laughs> and she says, well, one in a million. And how does he respond? Yes, I've got a chance. That's my motto in life. I've got a chance. <laughs> That's so good. My favorite line in that one is, and I'll <laughs> censor myself, is when he wakes up and they're supposed to be in Colorado and it's all planes. And he <laughs> looks around and he goes, that John Denver's full of... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's a great movie. All right. Good choice. I was not expecting that one from you. That's good. I like that. Good. If you had one album you could listen to, pick one album to listen to for the rest of your life, what would it be? Anything by the Allman Brothers. All right. And uh, last question, rainy days or sunny days? Sunny days. Yeah, I'm the same. It's pouring here today. And I just got back from a little anniversary vacation with my wife, ready to get back to work. And I wake up and it's pouring rain and I'm like, oh, I I just want to take a nap now. (laughs) I like the sun. Where are you at? Where are you located? Daytona Beach. Oh, yeah. So you do like the sun. Yeah. On the opposite side in Newport Beach. And we like the sun here, too. But pouring today. All right. Well, let's get into your nonprofit expertise. What is your origin story? How did you get into nonprofits and what are you doing? I appreciate that. Great question, Matt. I have literally been involved in nonprofit work, community organization, community activation, literally for all of my life. I was raised in a family that believed in giving back community service, and that's just kind of where I came from. So I've had a lifetime of lived experience working with not professionally and personally with nonprofit organizations nationwide. And then what I add to my work now as a speaker and a consultant is a full 30 plus year career in the world of NASCAR racing. So I bring in, in the world of not a driver, that's usually the first question. Well, wait, I never heard of you. What was your number? I don't remember. Well, not a driver, back of the house guy. And in my role working with the NASCAR group of companies, because there were several companies, but worked all over the country. And my job mandate, Matt, was to recognize problems before they existed and make sure they didn't happen. And then by any chance, if I let something slip through the cracks, I darn well better fix it and fix it quickly. So I bring that experience, a contrarian mindset that the NASCAR world is always challenging It doesn't matter if you win, you're going to tear your car down to find out why you won. And if you were second through 40th, second, according to Ricky Bobby and Talladega Knights, was first loser. So you're going to tear down your car to find out why you didn't win. So that contrarian world is something I bring to my work with in the world of nonprofits. Makes me a little bit different. Yeah, it's kind of a next level of critical thinking. It's really pushing for all points of view and what you can learn. 
which is so great because it's interesting to make the connection between NASCAR and all of that. It's not a sport I know much about. And so to hear about Ricky Bobby is the extent of my <laughs> my knowledge of the sport. But it's so interesting to hear that. And I love seeing how people can bring different pieces together to use in, in unique ways. So now you're a consultant, you're traveling around speaking, and you've written a book called Stop the Blame Game. And I'm assuming that the book is sort of the foundation for the consulting and the talks and the things that you give. Can you tell us a little bit about what's the book about and what's your main kind of message? Well, thank you so very much. And I kind of call back to a previous podcast you had with one of my all-time favorites, uh, Julia Campbell. And she was talking about her experience, if you recall, in the Peace Corps and her other kind of advocacy type roles. And she was always liking to challenge well, and I kind of share that mindset. I just got developed that mindset from a different place than she did, but we're kind of channeling that same don't accept status quo. You can be better than what you are. Well, in the world of nonprofits, the question of why don't board members do what they're supposed to do is probably one of the top one or two questions that keeps nonprofit leaders up at night. And any podcast, any blog, any LinkedIn group, anything, you're going to see a constant drumbeat about frustration around, well, my board members just aren't doing what they're supposed to do. They're just not engaged. They won't raise money. They don't do this. They don't do that. Well, the more I got to thinking about that, I said, you know, the world of nonprofits appears to be following the same best practices, if you will, to for board development, board engagement, board involvement. And those same practices don't appear to be getting the desired result that organizations want. They keep getting board members into the situation continues and maybe even gets worse over time that board members just are a source of a lot of frustration. So we all know that line about doing the same thing over and over, Matt, and expecting a different result. So I said, I've got to find out about this. I just can't let this sit. Why don't board members do what they're supposed to do? Why is there such criticism? So what I did a few years ago was launch off into a research project. And what I did was ask board members. I asked board members across the country, okay, you're getting a whole, you as a sector are getting a whole as a group are getting a whole lot of criticism, mad about you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Why is that? Could you elaborate? Could you go deep with me on that? And so, Matt, guess what? They told me. And I, very crude, I do not profess to be a professional data gatherer or survey master. Very simple email, three or four open-ended questions to nonprofit board members that I had met across the country in my different activities and networking. And what I got back was a very clear message of why good board members don't do what they're supposed to do and what turns them off. So I said, oh, holy smokes, I think I found the holy grail. And so that evolved into the book that you see today, which has become an Amazon bestseller. It's doing way better than I thought it would do. So I'm certainly appreciative of the nonprofit world responding so positively to it. So the book, number one, shares, it's from the board member perspective of why board members are not engaged, why they turn off, why they were good. And it's their perspective. And then so I take their perspective and then provide my insights on how you fix those situations. And there are a couple of key I would say self-inflicted issues that we as a nonprofit sector, we're doing these things to ourselves. So that's what the book is about. And I explain, and I'll be happy to share some key examples of that. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious because I have guesses in my head of what those might be having worked with a lot of nonprofits. And I'm wondering if is sort of clarity of the role a big one in there, because that's one that seems to come up a lot. Nonprofits often don't know how to use board members, and then they expect the board members to figure it out or to just know what they're supposed to do when the nonprofit really doesn't even know what it is that they're supposed to do. 
And, you know, that is a great point. Thanks for sharing that. You know, there's a lot of great research by Board Source and other highly reputable organizations. And this is a consistent criticism of nonprofit staff being critical of their board members not having adequate knowledge of their roles and responsibilities. Well, every time I see those studies, Matt, I'm thinking, duh. Are you going to blame me for being on your board and not knowing what I'm supposed to do? Who's supposed to coach me up? So what is the training? What's the adequate onboarding? What's the clarity? You mentioned the achieving clarity. And I talk a lot about getting clarity in the book, the orientation process. How many times is the orientation? And every time I mention this, there was way too much laughing going on in the room which I don't take as a positive because it's kind of like, oh, I'm admitting I'm doing this. Okay, Matt, congratulations on being a new board member. And by the way, here's our board manual. Look this over. Let me know if you have any questions. And that's the end of the orientation process. So getting the clarity, a quick point on that. I'm a huge advocate in the recruiting process of getting to clarity. And I put an emphasis on getting the clarity that's yours and theirs. So you share, Matt, what the nonprofit is expecting of their board member, and then stop talking and let them explain, number one, what their expectations are for serving on the board, your particular board. And then the third part of this critical conversation, Matt, is get to accept, confirm acceptance that they have agreed to whatever the ask is. So let me back up just quickly. Is your expectations and their list of expectations, do those match up? Are they compatible? And they might not be. So right now, wouldn't that be a red flag? Might not be a good board member for your organization. And another final point about clarity, so critical, Matt, to get clarity around expectations and acceptance, especially when fundraising is involved. Because my experience is, how often do you see, well, they're a board member, they should know they're expected to give money and raise money because they're just expected to. That's, (laughs) you're in for trouble when you have that assumption. Well, yeah, especially when you haven't communicated that assumption. It's the same as, you know, if I were to hire an employee and have a lot of expectations of what their skill sets are, how they're going to apply those, the whole kind of gambit, but didn't communicate any of that in the interview process and didn't communicate any of that in the orientation process. And then they get here and it's like, oh, by the way, this, 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 and this. And they're going, well, I didn't even know that was a job I was signing up for, (laughs) you know. Can I jump in on that, Matt? You're a marketing guy. So if you want to sell refrigerators, cars, new houses, or, or anything else, and you have an ad, and you're promising something. But when the customer walks into the store or goes to your online website and goes to purchase, and then all of a sudden the offer is not there anymore, that's called bait and switch. And you could go to jail for that. And I don't think you're going to go to jail for not fully explaining to a board member what the expectations are. But does it make sense? They get to that first board meeting and exactly what situation you just described They get to the first board meeting and, oh, by the way, Matt, here's what we're expecting you to do. Well, that feels like bait and switch, sounds like bait and switch, and they're done. You lost it. And I'm wondering if oftentimes starts innocently enough, because I've worked a lot with startup nonprofits. And with startup nonprofits, I find more often than not, there's not an understanding of what the board is supposed to be there for, what their role really is. You just know you're required to have one. They usually start by grabbing a few friends or people that they kind of a starter board there. And over time, it evolves. If they are successful and they grow, they're adding more people. They might be bringing in more people. They might be bringing in a little more formality. But that same sort of foundation of lack of certainty of how do I utilize this group I have some ideas, I'm not sure. And then you start building expectations that haven't been communicated and it starts at that foundational level. So I guess my question for you is, A, do you see that? And then B, do you ever work with startup nonprofits and what is the advice that you give them? Well, unfortunately, the situation you just described is not unique. 
in the world of nonprofits. Unfortunately, it's all too common. And it's well over a million and a half nonprofits of various sizes in this country now. And they're nonprofits just like growing like gangbusters all the time. Somebody has a great idea. Somebody has a good thought, a sincere thought, a way that they think they can help a particular or address a particular issue or a cause. Nothing wrong with that, but they jump right in and just exactly like you described, it's just no different than jumping in and starting a business. Oh, you know what? My grandmother makes the best meatballs and I think I could open up an Italian restaurant based on my, and there's no, other than your grandma's recipe for meatballs and you don't have her there in the kitchen cooking, by the way, and you got nothing else. You've never run a restaurant. You've never run a business. And what, nine out of 10 new business startups fail pretty quickly in the first, you know, same thing with nonprofits. So you start out with a passion and that's to be admired, right? You start out with this passion, you have a cause, you want to have an impact and you make a difference. But my advice is go the extra step. Make sure you've developed a business plan and go to your local, and these are nationwide your small business development center. They're usually in community colleges. They're all over the country. They're a great resource and there are other resources out there, but have a business plan. And what do you expect your board members to do? And other than that legal requirement to have three or four, just depending on what state you're in. And then you're exactly right, Matt, as you described, boards in nonprofits rather have a life a shelf life that expands. So there's the startup, then they evolve. And then the board asks, initially, it's probably could be an all hands on deck. The board members are doing everything. And that's okay. Just explain it to them ahead of time. Clarity, like we talked about, get the clarity. And then as you evolve, the board evolves too. But that's the big fail. And unfortunately, that failure to communicate Board expectations is not limited to new startup nonprofits. It affects nonprofits who've been around for decades. Definitely. And I think my thought was that maybe even with those ones that have been around for decades, it started with that foundation that wasn't properly established in the beginning. You had said starting a nonprofit is just as hard as starting a business. I would actually argue it's even harder. We were having an event here a couple of weeks ago, our nonprofit connect event, and we were talking with our guests and about all of the paperwork and the requirements and to be in compliance and all. It's actually greater. And there's so many people, I think, start nonprofits with this thought of, like you said, they're passionate, they've got something they love or they want to do that they know how to do. And they just think, oh, I'm just going to start a nonprofit. You file that form and then I'm off to the races. And they don't realize, no, not only do you need a business plan, you need an understanding of this particular type of business and how are you going to get this done and how are you going to grow and all of that. Most of the time, people who have are passionate about one thing, they know how to do that one thing and they haven't really thought through anything beyond that, including whether somebody else in their area is already doing the same thing and maybe they could partner up with them <laughs> instead of starting something new. I've been trying to work a lot with startup nonprofits to help them avoid some of these because they've got great potential. And I want to see them grow. But if they're going to do it, I want to see them do it right so that they don't end up in this place where they're 30 years in and they're successful, but they're burning through board members and burning through staff and all of that. And unfortunately, a lot of nonprofits, professionals, and when I mentioned earlier at the outset about self-inflicted wounds, a lot of nonprofit professionals will say, gee, Hardy, that's great. You're talking about you know communication and talking to board members and relationships. But that just takes time, and I don't have time to deal with all of that. And I just kind of throw up my hands. Well, you're the one complaining about all the frustration you're experiencing around your board members not wanting to do what you want them to do, and that's look in the mirror. Yeah, well, it's like anything else in life. When you make a change, there is that investment of time up front, but it saves you in the long run when you implement new procedures or processes, whether that's in business and whatever you're doing, personal life. And so many times it's making that conscious decision of, okay, I've got to stop, I've got to do this, and it's going to cost me time right now, 
but it's going to be worth it in the long run. Humans in general, I think we tend to think short term and getting people to think beyond the short term is sometimes a challenge, at least in my experience. You're totally 100 percent on target. (laughs) Nonprofits would do well to heed your thoughts and advice. Well, speaking of thoughts and advice, okay, so you've got an audience. You do right now. You've got all these people listening, nonprofit leaders. What is your advice to them for where they might be at today with their boards? Where do you start? Number one, get the right people. And too many organizations don't associate intentionality around board recruitment. And quite often, I'm a sports nut. I love college sports. And actually, to me, recruiting is like a second sport. So you've got to think in advance and every board is different. Every organization is different. And even within an organization, uh, the board you need, the skills, experience I'm talking about that you needed 10 years ago, probably much different 10 years later in 2024. And it's going to be, who knows what 2025 is going to bring. So what are the skills that you need? What's the experience that you need? What are the talents that your particular organization needs for the next three or four year window? And then start building a list around potential board members who meet that criteria and start developing, recruit in advance, not the last board meeting before the annual meeting and you're sitting around there, Matt. Oh, you know, well, Matt's coming off the board and who do you think we could get to replace him? Gosh, I don't know. Matt, do you know anybody? I eh, really, I don't know. I said, well, Matt, no. Well, I, and so all of a sudden, there you are 30 days away from needing to fill a seat and no one has a clue. Is there any reason to put yourself in that situation? No. Have your prospects in advance and maybe consider creating farm clubs of being able to get your board potentials involved as key volunteers. And so they can demonstrate their capability for being a good, solid board member for your organization. So work in advance, recruit board members with purpose in process. And if you have board members who aren't doing what they're supposed to do, chances are you do not have the right people. Would you say that and or you haven't communicated to them what that is? That's the next level part of all of this. So we've covered getting the clarity part. Board members have shared with me, and I hope our nonprofit Connect audience will really pay attention here, Matt. Board members have shared with me the number one reason why good board members turn off is poor communication. Poor communication. I'm not talking about frequency because Hardy, we... We do annual reports and we send emails and we have meet reports at the board meetings and on and on. I'm not talking about the power of communication. I'm talking about is your communication effective? And one of the things that we fail to take into account, you're in the communication business, Matt. So we fail to take into account, just visualize. If everyone listening today would just visualize their last board meeting, the faces around the room. Just close your eyes, visualize those faces. Well, as you're kind of mentally looking at your board, every single one of those different board members has a individual different preference on how they prefer to be communicated with. So open your eyes now. Some may want detailed reports. Some may just can't get enough debt. Some a simple text message might suffice. Some in advance phone call before a controversial item or contentious type item is going to be on the agenda will kind of preempt a little angst that might get generated. So you've got to consider, are you being effective? So here's a real easy test, nonprofit leaders. If you're wondering, are you being effective with your board members in your communication? How could you do that? How could you make sure you're being effective? Ask them. And I'm not talking about in a board meeting, asking to a group, hey, am I, how am I doing with communication? No, nope. I'm talking about one-on-ones. So Matt, how do you prefer to be communicated with? How often do you want to be communicated with? What type of information would help you and your board experience. 
So make sure you're being an effective communicator. Man, you said something earlier, so very important, because I can just hear right now so many nonprofit professionals right now on the podcast, in the audience right now. Great. We're overworked. We're understaffed. We're underpaid. We're underappreciated. And now this guy is piling on more for us to do. Just great, Matt. Where did you find this guy? I'm tired of getting into what Matt said. You can preemptively do work in advance. Yes, more work on the front end, but on the back end is going to make your life so much easier and so much better and is practically guaranteed to eliminate a good chunk of the frustration you may be feeling right now. So those are some quick hitters on how to be more effective and have better relationships with your board members. Well, and it seems to me that it's the basis of any good communication. You've got to know your audience. And so taking the time to actually get to know them, what they bring, how they prefer to communicate, all of those things is going to make you more effective. And not only that, you're going to stop, hopefully, I think, stop seeing your board as your adversary and instead as your ally, as part of we're on the team together. And it might take a little time to get there, but that's going to pay off when you suddenly have this team behind you championing you and giving you the resources you need to accomplish the things you want to do instead of this board that you have to go and fight for what you want or whatever it might be. It's so interesting because, yeah, the larger organizations, very much the types of things you're talking about, the smaller organizations, what I see most often is they put together a board because they're required to. They don't know how to use them. So... They're required once a year meeting and the board members do nothing, not because they don't want to, but the founder is just doing all the work and they're not even thinking about like, how do I utilize my board? It's like, oh yeah, I checked off that requirement. Okay, cool. And (laughs) this is a group of people here meant to support you and the mission of the organization. How do we set this up to be a winning combination? And it sounds like this is what you're all about. Yes. And a quick tag on communication, effective communication. Anyone who is in a successful long-term relationship, either personal or in business, knows the keys to a successful relationship. There's trust, there's attention, there's a showing appreciation, recognition of the other person, acknowledgement of how much the other individual means. The number one, the key every single time in a training session, I ask this question, what is the number one most essential element to a successful relationship 100% of the time? It's communication. So if you want good, solid relationships with your board members, make sure you're being a good, effective communicator. And by the way, P.S., What's the most important part of good communication? Listening. Listen to your board members. Listen to them. That's great. This is, I think, very good practical advice for the people listening, because whether you started a nonprofit or you got hired into one and you're finding a dysfunctional relationship with your board, I think there's no better time than to st- than now to stop and go, how can I approach this differently? How can we fix this? How can we make this better and make this truly a team that is working together to accomplish a common goal. Wow, Hardy, this has been really, really great, super helpful information. We always close with a few questions. What's one thing that makes you feel most connected to your community, to your work, whatever it might be? What makes me feel most connected, and this would apply to nonprofit board members as well, so it's like a two-for-one answer here, is feeling like I'm making a difference feeling like I'm having an impact, feeling like that my opinion matters and it's valued. And, you know, to tie it back in, the thing that's necessary for you to feel that way is communication. Absolutely. Who in the world of nonprofits would you most like to take to lunch? There are so many amazing individuals. I'll tell you what, the person I would really like to be able to spend more time with is Simone Joyo. And Simone Joyo passed away just a few years ago. And Simone was a very, very special individual, a champion contrarian. She refused to accept the status quo. Anyone involved in fundraising, 
AFP certainly is going to know the name of Simone Julio. I was extremely fortunate to have a relationship with her. She was a beta reader for my book. She provided just a wonderful endorsement for the book. And she passed away about a month after I got her beta reader comments for the book. And that's someone I just really just wish I had one more opportunity to visit individuals, special person. Well, I'm sorry about that, but she sounds amazing. I'm going to have to look into her. Finally, what aspect of your job brings you the most joy? What really helps me get joy is seeing organizations, individuals letting me know, hey, Hardy, thank you for that speech you gave. Thank you for that workshop. Thank you for the book. Wow, you were on point. You really resonated with me. I got some great tips from you. I wish I had your book earlier. It's working. It's helping. You are making a difference. So I guess just hearing that, you know, uh, it's working. There's an impact. Knowing that the thing you're spending your time on and your passion on is actually connecting. That's, of course, yeah. Well, thank you so much. How can people find you? Obviously, there's the book Stop the Blame Game by Hardy Smith. They can check that out. I'm assuming anywhere you can get books or... But how else can people connect with you? I'm in Barnes & Noble. I'm on the Indie Portal. You can get my book. It's accessible in any bookstore. You can order it online. Amazon, it's a bestseller on Amazon. So check that out. It's available in the Kindle version also, if you like the Kindle platform. Uh, HardySmith.com is my website. So you can find me easily, HardySmith.com. Perfect. Well, Hardy, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I'm sure our listeners are going to have a lot of things to think about <laughs> with their with their board members and their relationships after this, but it's been great talking to you. Matt, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Again, congratulations to you in getting the Nonprofit Connect podcast launched. Such a valuable resource for our nonprofit world. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Here we are at the end. You made it. Thank you so much for listening this far. And if you'd like to hear more from Nonprofit Connect brought to you by Rogue Creatives, well, then make sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on so you don't miss out because you don't want to miss out. You want to be on the you want to be on the end. You know, you want to be on the inner circle. You want to know what's going on. Also, if you're interested in working with us or want to reach out or tell us how amazing we are, visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. You can get all the info there. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Well, we won't see you. We'll hear you. Well, you'll hear us. But whatever. Bye. Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is hosted and executive produced by me, Matt Barnes, with an assist by my chaos coordinator, Tiffany Pope. Production is by our amazing friends over at Fame, the B2B podcast agency, along with Belinda Carter-Thompson and the team here at Rogue Creatives. Production lead is Luke Audi at Fame. Writing is by Sam Hollis at Fame and Matt Barnes and Taylor Bolanos from Rogue Creatives. Nemanja Koljaja of Fame is our audio editor. And Arslan Yakub from Fame is our video editor. Creative direction is by Corey Hill of Rogue. Our artwork is designed by Hope O'Kelly and Joshua Marino at Rogue and Ian Salas of Fame. Theme music is composed and performed by Jared Atherton of Chapters. Luke Audi of Fame does our booking and our guest relations. Huge thanks to our amazing guests for joining us for this episode and to all of you incredible listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, and I don't know why you wouldn't have don't forget to help us spread some good by giving us a good review preferably you know five stars with lots of words saying how amazing we are on whatever platform you're listening on apple Podcasts, spotify whatever it is also tell your friends and subscribe so we can come straight into your potholes each and every time we have a new episode for more information about nonprofit connect or to join us at a live event here in orange county california visit our website npconnect.roguecreatives.com we'll catch you next time This has been a Rogue Creatives production.